He is an assistant surgeon of orthopedics in Medic Madras Medical College. Sir, please come forward, sir. Very good evening. I thank Life and Gordon Markham and uh, Dr. Reddy's for inviting me for uh, guest lecture. The topic is uh, very, a very quiet topic, pain management and orthopedics. Um, so I, I restricted myself. Um, so the common orthopedic issues, pain management and common orthopedic issues. Of the, of the, what kids we see in clinic. So I thought uh, before going to management, uh, defining pain would be a right uh, choice. So, definition for pain it's a complex, unpleasant phenomenon, comes of sensory experiences, it's an unpleasant emotional experience. Originating a potentially damaged or a really damaged tissue. And this phenomenon is innately experienced by individual. So this cannot be adequately defined. Next. So coming to uh, when the, we are not able to properly define pain, and then there will be something, there's some system interacting so that this complex phenomenon is unfolded. What are the three systems? There is some sensory motivation of cognitive system. The sensory component is a discriminant. It's a process. The information we got to the brain is processed. And what are the things that is processed? The brain is strength, intensity, the quality of the brain is processed. The motivational is an affective behavior. It's a, it determines the approach and awareness behavior of the individual. The cognitive is then evaluated. It's a modulate, it modulates the perception of pain. So these three systems interact to produce pain. So if, if this is a definition and uh, the system interacting, we should uh, classify pain. Pain can be generally classified as somatogenic and psychogenic pain. In a somatic, somatogenic pain, it can be further classified into nociceptive and neuropathic pain. The somatic pain, somatogenic pain usually is a potentially damaged tissue. There is a damage of physical cause in somatogenic pain. Whereas psychogenic pain, there is no physical cause. Um, depending on the duration of the pain, pain can be classified into acute pain and chronic pain. Next. The acute pain is uh, sudden in an injury, usually it's an injury or a muscle spasm or a neurological symptom. Uh, which its origin is very short duration. Next. It's usually a protective mechanism which alerts into it. It mobilizes the individual to give a prompt action of relief. If there is an injury, the individual goes from the side of injury to avoid further damage. So it's a protective mechanism. Acute pain is a protective mechanism. Next. The response to acute pain is increased heart rate, diaphoresis, increased respiratory rate, increased blood sugar, elevated BP, and flushing their pupils and all of that. That is decreased acidity decreased gastric mobility. These are the responses to acute pain. The psychological or behavioral response to acute pain is fear, anxiety, and unpleasantness. Next. Coming to chronic pain, a pain that exists for at least a period of six months, then we categorize that pain in a chronic pain. Next. The chronic pain can be further classified to persistent pain or intermittent pain. The intermittent pain is an acute exacerbation of a chronic pain. This pain is just behaves like an acute pain. This is a chronic type of pain, but it behaves like acute pain. But the patient feels anxiety, fear, like that. Whereas a persistent pain, a dull aching pain, persisting more than six months, is called chronic pain. Next. The response to chronic pain is mainly depression. The patient feels hopelessness. These patients have sleep disorders. And they are constantly preoccupied with the pain. Next. So defining pain threshold and pain tolerance. Pain threshold is a point at which a stimulus is perceived as pain. But whereas a pain tolerance is a duration of time or intensity of the pain that the patient will feel that there's an over-response to it. He, 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 
it gives an over response to a pain after a period of time or intensity of the pain. That's called pain tolerance. When uh, pain tolerance is increased, it is increased at the time of alcohol con uh, consumption, hypnosis, one the distracting activities and strong belief of faith. The patient like where the, in a temple where they go for uh, meditation now, the pain tolerance is increased. So there, we need a higher duration of time to initiate a overt response or intensity of the pain stimulus should be more to uh, exert a overt response. It is decreased by repeated exposure. The tolerance level is decreased. The fatigue, anger, boredom, and apprehension all will decrease the pain threshold. The same individual, where is apprehended, or sleep deployed. If you give a small dose of pain stimulus, or a small duration of pain stimulus, he gives an over response. Next. So coming to the neuroanatomy of pain. Neuroanatomy, uh, 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 neurological phenomena of the pain has three components. One, next. The first one is the afferent pathway where the pain is taken from the site of stimulus to the central nervous system, the second component, and further down from the central nervous system to the efferent pathway. The afferent pathway consists of the nociceptors or the pain receptors. The pain receptors contains of the free nerve endings and the um, puffinian copper cells like that. These pain receptors, nociceptors, perceive the stimulus they convert into electrical uh, stimulus or signal. It is travels the afferent nerve fibers. This afferent nerve fiber consists of the alpha A delta fibers and C fiber. The A delta fiber is a thick myelinated fiber, and C fiber is a small, thin, unmyelinated fiber. The central nerve system, in processing the uh, stimulus, perceived stimulus, the limbic system, reticular formation, thalamus, and hypothalamus. Coming to the efferent pathway, right from the central nervous system, the efferent pathway comes, fibers from the central nervous system comes down to the spinal cord level, whereas it suppresses the stimulus. That is, the efferent pathway of the pain mechanism is an inhibitory pathway. The other two was uh, Exhibitory path, where the rest is inhibitory path. Next. So you can see the nociceptors, the pain is perceived by the nociceptors, connected through the nerve C fibers and nerve A delta fibers, and synapses with the substantia gelatinosa in the spinal cord. It is taken from the SG center through the spinal thalamic tract to the brain, where the brain processes the information and uh, the three systems interact. The, central, the sensory, motivational and cognitive system, whether to give a over response or not, modulation occurs. If there is a modulation, it sends inhibitory signal through the fibers to the substantive directness so to suppress the pain response. Next. See, in the afferent system, the nerve, as I already said, nociceptors, the small unmyelinated free nerve endings and certain uh, receptors for pesicin cortisol cells uh, we have read before. All these uh, receptors, what is it? Is a, it converts in mechanical energy into and transfer, transduces into a chemical or an electrical signal and passes through the nerve fibers. The nerve, the uh, nerve receptors can be stimulated by chemical mediators as well. Here, the chemical mediators are the prostaglandins, histamine, and bradykinin is a very powerful uh, uh, pain stimulator. Substance B is recently found this substance that is, uh, is more powerful than bradykinin. If there is a mild stimulation of the nociceptors, that can be a tingling sensation. If the same stimulation is profound, the stimulation is stronger, the duration of the stimulation is longer, then it, the same uh, stimulus gives a pain sensation. The differences depend on the frequency and amplitude of the front signal transmitted from the nerve ending to the circuit. See this. Next. So you can see from the nociceptors, the miscellaneous corpuscles, muscle spindle, tendon bundle, all these pacinian corpuscles, all these are nociceptors. From there, they travel to 
along with C fibers and A8 other fibers, they, they snap to the spinal cord in the substantia gelatinosa level. Substantia gelatinosa can be divided into around five to six layers. And the, these fibers uh, interact snaps with the various levels of substantia gelatinosa. Next. As it is in the synapse, the second order neuron goes above along the spinal cord through the spinal thalamic tract. They, they synapse to this thalamus, hypothalamus, and from there they are projected on the cerebral cortex. This is the central nervous system where the information is processed. Next. So, inferences are consist of the, the main role is inhibition of the front pain. Here, the pain, the, the neurons in the periaculatory gray area is the main neuron where it sends inhibitory um, signal to the substantial fluid muscle through the different fibers. Okay? The main uh, um, chemical mediator, this neurotransmitter is GABA pentane. GABA. Next. So, with the fibers from the central nervous system in the beat, the substantial nerve fibers on the substantial cell Next. Next. So, coming to the theories of pain, uh, the well known theory is gate control theory, which was formed by, uh, described by Melzack and Wall. Here, the stimulation of large nerve fiber, which is an alpha, A alpha and A beta cells, it closes the gate. If it is a closure of gate, the further nerves um, pain. Uh, further pain stimulus cannot be perceived by the central nervous system. At the same time, the stimulation of small fibers, that's the opening of the gate. So these patients will have enormous pain stimulus. Next. See, as you can see, the large fibers because the substantial developments are further the great control of sweat is closed. The same thing, thing is that's an inhibitory effect. Here the small fibers also has an inhibitory effect. It has a positive effect, so it opens the gate. Next. Coming to the mechanism of uh, inflammatory pathway, here the electronic acid is produced by the damage of cell membrane. And on the arachnoidic uh, acid, um, the locks and box converts and produces the color of prostaglandins and liver veins. Prostaglandins, as we know, is a powerful pain stimulator. Okay? And it further comes down to produce pain and inflammation. The liver veins, where they recruit inflammatory cells, are the second inflammation and produces various bromoconstriction. Airway obstruction and cell infiltration. Next. Okay, just to initiate us, say, uh, once there is cell damage, from the membrane there are phospholipids are released. The phospholipids are degraded into electronic acid. And further, if the electronic acid is acted upon the lipoxidic system, it produces leukotriens. If it is attacked by the cox, cyclooxidic system, then it produces prostate the prostaglandins further divided into thromboxin and thromboxin. These, these are uh, pain as well as, they are, these act as a chemotherapy agent as well as uh, a pain stimulator. Next. A chronic pain, our main uh, field of interest will be a chronic pain. Next. Some of the chronic, chronic pains we see in our clinic will be a persistent low back pain. This will be the majority of the, of the cases in our uh, orthopedic opinion. A chronic pain of the cancer, which is a sub separate entity. A neurologist. Neurologists we see more common of reflex sympathetic dystrophies. The commonest is pseudex hostile dystrophy after uh, colis fracture. The myofascial pain syndromes, hemiagnosia, where the patient will not be able to describe what uh, uh, material or object is there in the hand. Phantom limb is uh, where uh, an amputated limb, the patient feels. There is a limb existing even after an amputation. Next. Okay, just a few words of muscle, muscle uh, pain pathophysiology. Now I finish the neuronal pain. In case of muscle pain, muscle pain is uh, mainly a somatic deep pain. 
Usually the muscle is insensitive to pain. The fascia that is covering the muscle will be painful. The pain is originated because of tapomyolysis and accumulation of lactic acid and other metabolites. These two reasons would be the prime cause of muscle pain. So, coming to the most common chronic pain would be a back pain. In an orthopedic OPD, around 70% of the um, OPD cases will be a patient with back pain. And uh, now the recent uh, study has shown that there are five models of uh, distribution. That is, uh, the patient either come on the 30 to 20 to 30 years of age, another is 50 to 60, of age, 60 years of age. Next. Some of the uh, well, the difference in the diagnosis of low back pain would be a mechanical low back pain and a non-mechanical uh, condition or an unofficial disease. See, the mechanical low back pain would be 95 or 97% of that lumbar strain would be 70%. Lumbar strain would be, would be if you take an MRI scan and see, there won't be any uh, physical cause for that, but the patient complains of severe back pain. And of that, uh, very famously, uh, spoken or uh, talk, talk disease will be a heritage disc. It causes only 4% of the back pain causes. The other causes are very few. Neoplasia is 0.7%, infection is 0.01%, inflammatory arthritis is 0.3%. See, mechanical cause will be around 97% of his lumbar strain alone is 70%. The result causes will be very, very major. See, a, back, a, patient, uh, a patient comes with back pain, what we assume or think in terms would be the pain due to muscle. As I told, the muscle pain would be either due to rhabdomyolysis or it could be due to accumulation of lactic acid or other metabolites. In case of muscle spasm, these things will happen. And the patient uh, will be, so the cause would be a muscle pain, uh, originate from muscle. Okay? If there is a pathology vasculature, this is a very small cause, but it can occur. The visceral cause is also very small. The other cause will be bone and the ligament that is involved in the back pain. Next. So you have this, uh, you can see the epidural space here, the cord structure and the dura surrounding the spinal cord. The nerve is existing through the foramina. This one is a facetal facet of the, the transverse process, spinous process. This is a superior facet and this one is the, the inferior facet. Next. You can see a herniated disc that is compressing the nerve that is exiting on the foramina. This is a cross section showing the compression of the foramina. Next. See, I just want to throw some light on the, uh, the common problems in the OPD. The next common problem is the tennis elbow and orthopedic OPD, where there is an inflammation, it's called lateral epicondylitis, the inflammation of the common extensor origin. Next. It usually occurs with a more, it's a, um, a, a low-raised in injury. It is called a repetitive stress disorders. And now another new term has come up in the um, medical fraternity is uh, musculoskeletal disorders, further classified into repetitive stress disorders, RSD. Here it's more, before it was more common in tennis players and golf players, so, so it's called the weekend warrior type. The medical term is a basic on Next. The symptoms and signs would be pain in the elbow on the lateral side. Whenever the patient is trying to lift anything by, uh, or uh, writing or uh, using the forearm, there will be pain in the elbow. You can see the inflammation of the common extensor origin. Next. The shoulder pain will be the third common cause where um, the patient comes with a, a pain. Uh, in case of history of these patients, they either have a elderly uh, in in patient with an osteoarthritis in the shoulder joint, very minimal, or recent uh, trauma, or the patient may be diabetic patient. These people will definitely have shoulder pain. Um, where the first cause would be an osteoarthritis of the shoulder joint where they have uh, a chronic uh, pain. In case of the recent uh, trauma, there is prolonged uh, immobilization of the shoulder joint and the, when the capsule of the shoulder joint becomes stiff and then they develop periarthritis or adhesive capsulitis of the shoulder joint. 
you can see the tendon, or the bicep tendon and bursa here. You can see the rotator cuff as well. Next. Here the rotator cuff is thrown. If not uh, properly treated, uh, surgically or conservatively, these patients will definitely become uh, um, a chronic, uh, chronic pain category. Next. This is the shoulder impingement syndrome where there is an abduction above 70 to 80 degrees. The GT is humerus, compresses over the acromion, inside the first size compressor, and then they have called the uh, shoulder impingement syndrome. Or if there is a shoulder arc, the patient is asked to update from 0 degree to 9 degrees. Initially, they have, uh, uh, don't have pain. And by 30 degrees of abduction, they will start pain. And by 90 degrees, this pain will Next. So they are uh, almost uh, osteoarthritis of joints, uh, knee pain and shoulder, uh, hip pain. Next. The osteoarthritis can be classified into two types. One is primary osteoarthritis, another is secondary osteoarthritis. Primary osteoarthritis is, uh, it is a misnomer. It is called the primary arthrosis, osteoarthrosis. It is due to mainly due to aging. Second thing is the pathology. Next. Sir, can you summarize, sir? You yes. overshot your time. Next. <coughs> so, next. Okay, my approach. Please. So, knowing the for definition of pain and the pathology of pain and the various clinical aspects in an OBD, I approach in this system. The first step would be an analgesic and a physiotherapy. Uh, we do it for a period of three months, an session of three, three, three. Okay. If the patient is not responding to it, then we give a steroid injection on the other side. In case of osteoarthritis, periatal shoulder, tennis elbow, anything. And around 90 to 97 percent respond to the uh, conservative management. If these people are not responding, then uh, the surgical option is the one. So step one, two, and three. This is the way I approach my patients in OB. So who has given a three-step ladder where to choose for the analysis? It would be a mild, my, uh, moderate pain and severe pain. So, yeah, um, Nimusoride is a wonder drug, but recently he was banned in, uh, in, our, in, in our country. Um, I hope that this will be a eye opening session. Nimusoride was first synthesized uh, in 1971 by Dr. George Moore. It was launched in our country in 1996. This drug was uh, mainly used by uh, pediatricians, and it was banned for its hepatotoxicity. Now, we are proved beyond doubt that. Next Nimusoride is a preferential COX-2 inhibitor where it blocks the prostaglandin synthesis and by that by the inflammatory process is reduced. Next. You can see the COX-2 inhibition. So it has analgesic effect as well as antibiotic. Next. So the therapeutic efficacy is in par with its own contemporary drugs that is the diclofenac and acetophenac. So two week and four weeks uh, efficacy is much better and much tolerated than other uh, uh, NSAIDs. Next, the safety profile will be it is uh, it, uh, mainly the NSAIDs is being uh, metabolized in the liver, um, and the GI profile is uh, much tolerated and safer than the other. Next, heterodoxicity goes. How are heterodoxicity? The same pharmacoepidemic studies suggest this no more than other other Next. Can you summarize please in more short time? That's uh, Samuel Gomez has uh, picked the reason to guess it. Next. European Agency has already this. Next. Component from the sensory component or a tolerant level from 
the output of our life. We have any analysis to pay. What I find is most of the even top people have a chill prescription like that is that. We have any analysis on that to give this specific input to this drug should be used. That is the pain grading and pain scaling for itself, but it will be used in the inpatient uh, people. Outpatient, we don't have anything. The careful history taking would uh, help us in uh, choosing the drugs. Like uh, in case of uh, lumbar strain, and uh, we hope it, the pain, if you think the pain is due to the muscle spasm, a muscle relaxant would be a much better choice than giving an, an, a plain NACD. In case of a neurological pain like burning sensation or tingling sensation, we, we prescribe a GABA pethin pregalin with the or uh, this, this includes a neurological pain. Uh, careful history would be a better choice than making a decision in this case. So there's a role of antidepressants in chronic pain, especially lower lumbar, uh, said about more than six months. Any pain does produce a depression in a patient. Definitely. So what is your opinion on the role of antidepressants? And as an orthopedician, majority of them use the conventional tricyclic antidepressant. It's dizzy in the case of an elderly patient. What's your experience? Um, what I prescribe would be tryptophan anticyclic uh, Chronic pain can be. But uh, as they keep complaining of the pain, then uh, <coughs> definitely go for a super specialist to bring in. 